Hi, everybody. Welcome along to episode 109 of Percussion Discussion. As always, I'm going to ask you to please check out our social media. You'll find us on Facebook and Instagram. And of course, not forgetting our world famous YouTube channel where you can find all the conversations past and present. Please subscribe. It only takes a second and it really helps us. If you'd rather listen on the go, you will find all of our conversations available in podcast form. These are free to download from your favorite podcast provider. If you can find a second to spare, please rate and review. This way it finds, uh, hopefully, will find its way to lots of other drummers who enjoy the conversations as much as you do. On to today's guest. I'm really excited about this one. Uh, I've been a fan of this band since about 1987. Um, a band with an incredible, incredible uh, back catalog of just wonderful songs. Um, they've, they've done some of the biggest gigs on earth. Um, a guy with a very unique sound, a very unique footprint, a footprint, I should say, um, great use of electronics and rotor toms and a very unique looking drum kit. Let's get on to it. It gives me great, great pleasure to welcome the fabulous John Farris. John, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate you giving your time up. Yeah, look, I, I'm grateful. Uh, again, um, before we started recording, I, I said to you that I was just, um, when you're rattling off some of the names who you've interviewed before, um, it's an honor to be in the presence uh, of those names. And also that you've taken the time to, to uh, especially our time difference. I'm in Australia, you're in the UK. <laughs> and 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 you got the dirty end of the stick there with time. Um, you're probably a bit younger than me, so you're probably able to cope with those rock and roll hours a bit better than I am these days. So thanks so much for having me. You're welcome. And, uh, look forward to chatting. I'm not sure I agree with that statement, but thanks anyway. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's great. And before I mean. before we get stuck into it, uh, I have to thank. Um, I, I know he's a friend of yours, and he's a, he's a friend of my mutual friend Steve Barney as well. So Paul Beard, thank you very much for taking the time to connect us up. I know I know he's a good friend of yours, John. Yeah, yeah, and AKA Beardy. Uh, is is uh, he's also known as um, but yeah thanks Paul thanks buddy to work with me and um, I was introduced to Paul through uh, Kieran Gribben who is a very very close friend of mine and one of my co-writers uh, and I, he's probably you know one of the most inspiring people I know Kieran uh, who also was the last uh, public singer uh, in excess tour with and that's the connection with yeah. Paul. Um, beard and um who's moved to sydney australia and uh of course i moved out of sydney australia <laughs> about five years ago so I, I you know if if I, the only thing i really miss about sydney is having the close proximity to more musicians mm. studios and the like um and not being near paul yeah <laughs> so thanks paul for the hookup Ah, uh, yeah, it's really appreciated. Thank you, Paul. So, uh, what what's happening at the moment, John? Are you keeping busy? Oh yeah, yeah, I am. You know, and um, uh, with the anticipation of that question, um, I actually was giggling to myself because it's actually hard to define all the things that I do um, to make it sound, you know, um, really exciting. But it's not that exciting, except to say that um, the world we live in right now is. Um, you know, a lot of changes are going on. And through the courses of those changes, while it's very challenging, it's really, you know, put mankind on notice. And so for me personally, my personal development, my spiritual development and everything else is basically on, on high alert. Mm -hmm. So I take most of my time to reflect, study, research, um, I do still do a bit of music, but I keep it sort of in a kind of precious part of my my time. Um, I've still got two young kids. I'm not, I mean, they're they're kind of getting into teenagers now, so um, pretty busy there with the family life, and that that's just the way I've always wanted it. So after all those years of touring um, and wishing I was at home, I'm finally home, <laughs> and uh, really enjoying that. Um, but I do have a couple of little uh, uh, musical projects. Uh, yeah, spinning in the background. I don't know. I've said that a lot before, um, but it really is about uh, my music and my connection to music at the moment is my conduit to express how I, I think the world is and um, where we're all heading. 
And, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so, you know, to just answer that question, um, I've been doing a lot. I live on a farm. I do a bit of farm work. Wow. Um, and, uh, uh, my, um, yeah, my family are close by and, and that's just awesome. So, yeah. So, so life is good. Life is great. You know, uh, it really is. Yeah. It, it, tell me, it, it, look, yep. Go on, I was going to say, do you, do you still get behind the drum kit, uh, fairly regularly? No, I don't. I, you know, I never really did. <laughs> um, it, it's one of those weird things. Um, you know, when I was in my touring heyday, which is most of my life, mm -hmm. I was playing all the time, you know, um, obviously two hours a night and, and usually a sound check. And, and each one of those sort of situations, um, you know, always put me in um, performance mode no matter what I was doing. Like, so whenever I dressed the throne or I sat down and I was applying myself to a kit, it was... Uh, I never really had a lot of explorative time on my own just to dingle dangle and tinkle and tinkle. You know, it was once once I was at the kit, um, it, I almost addressed it in a spiritual way, you know. Uh, and so I, 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 I'm either on or I'm off, you know what I mean? Um, so even though uh, I've got studio equipment, I've got all fancy microphones and I love all that stuff and I love all the technical stuff inside of, of music. Um, the drums, even though it's, it's my main craft, um, I, I really don't play enough, you know, I, I just don't. But, but when I do sit down to it, I can usually kind of pull back yeah. and, and draw back, you know, where I left off, but I'm getting older now, Maddie, and, and I find that I can't draw back quite as fast as I used to be able to do. <laughs> it's a little confronting. I've got to be honest. It's a bit confronting. Um, my mind knows what to do. My body is a bit late or, if, you know, I, I go, did you get it or whatever? You know, I miss that. I go, what happened? You know, so, well, I'm not, I'm not doing my drumming carters, you know, I'm not sure. practicing enough and, and, and that, that, that I miss, but I don't really have the, not I'm not in the environment mm. uh, um, to 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 drum as much as I'd like to, but but I I still listen like I'm a dr like I'm drumming. You know, I still drum in my head. You know, I, I don't know if that makes sense. You, you mentioned before that you were doing gigs, so you, you know what I mean. Mm. Yeah. Um, when you're preparing for a gig, or you're thinking about a song, or you're thinking about a set, or you're thinking about whatever you, you you're about to do a few hours in a few hours time. The mind is already like like this kind of the cogs are spinning and the wheels are starting to spin and I'm already dropping stuff into my mind where I want it to be and by the time I, I, I get to the throne I'm on, and I'm on, usually somehow the connection uh, it all works and comes together. So you know I'm always very grateful for that. Oh, well, that's good. That's good. Well, I, I, you know it, it's you've influenced so many people over the years. And th th there was a question that um, a friend of mine put out on social media. I, told him, I, was, told, I was told him that I was going to be speaking to you. And he said, oh, do you mind if I just ask a question anonymously? What if you got the chance to speak to John Farris? And, um, and one of the answers he got back was uh, the drummer from Keen was Richard Hughes. Uh, one of the questions, I should say. And um, yeah. he, he asked this, and it was, it was a really interesting question. And it said, I wonder if John sees and hears how his playing influenced a generation of drummers who grew up listening to N in excess and how he feels about it which i thought is such a cool question to write wow. so i thought i'm gonna well, I'm gonna pass that one on because that's a really good well, so thank, well i mean that's actually floored me uh i wasn't really expecting that um also i'm a huge fan of king mm. so i mean I, I, there was a, a time where i had that that one of their albums on on repeat it hopes and fears. Um, hopes and fears. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, nothing to be to. I can't remember the lyrics. Um, beautiful music. Um, I think it was around two thousand seven, two thousand eight, something like two thousand six, two thousand seven. Yeah, something like that. Right. Yeah. Um, and uh, I listen to it all the time. Um, <clears throat> but to answer the question, um, I'm not really aware I, I i can i i can see i can see it mixed among amongst everything else but 
but you know, where do I claim? You know, I mean, I can't claim. I recognize influences, but you know, I would say the same back. Like, do you realize how much other? Do you see? You know, what what um, anyone's work can can influence someone else, and and I and I can see how I have influenced other people, but 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 can you see how other people have influenced me? I mean, you know, see how it all kind of works, you know. Of course, and, I, I get um, that. It's a tricky one to answer, isn't it? Well, what, what I, where I find the most interesting tilt of the hat to my drumming is really around the period in the 80s where Australian, I, and I only realised it later on, is that the Australian rock scene, the Australian pub rock scene, which is where we hailed from, um, I can see a lot of my influences in the Australian side of stuff. Mm. You know, there are certain um, albums or certain um, bands that were were coming through. You know, while we were just carving it internationally, and, and I was away. You know, I wasn't in Australia much at all. Um, and because we didn't have internet, we didn't have these instant sort of grabs where we want them. Um, I didn't even know some of the music until I got back to Australia. Mm. And then it was a few years later that I heard it and go, "Gee, that's really." I can hear there's influencing of mine coming through that. Sure. But, and the only other time I really knew, like, um, like being told to my face uh, that, that not so much my drumming, but I think, you know, in excess was heavily influenced and, I, and, and by default would be my drumming, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, was Mick Jagger. Um, okay. Where I was standing in his hotel room because uh, we were hanging out a bit. Uh, we were on an Australian tour in 1991 and uh, he was doing his Mick Jagger tour mm -hmm. and we, we were kind of mm -hmm. like riding along the uh, touring um, circuit kind of the same time. We, always, we were in the same cities every time, you know, we had a gig. He was the night before or the night after or whatever. So he, he was at our shows a lot. Um, but I was in his hotel room in Sydney and he started playing a cassette of his demos for Steel Wheels. Mm. And he's going, and he was singing like the Mick Jagger thing, you know, when he puts his hand behind his back and he's singing to my face along with these, these songs. Well, he's got a ghetto blaster in his hand and he's going, In Excess inspired this, In Excess inspired this. And, and it was just one of those moments where I'm like, um, Is that not got a video camera? Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> I'd like to capture this moment. Um, yeah. But that was one of the most, really um it was a, it was a gift really because that's the sort of thing that i you know i would only dream of i never expected um but that kind of validation coming from someone so so high in in, in the order of of pop music you know in it, in it's um just the way it, it all came about and everything it was wonderful to have Mick Jagger um validating that that our music is now considered something worthy of inspiration or, or that's going to lend into the next generation or, or bleed through and in, in, into what everyone else is doing so i'm very grateful for the question and, and i'm grateful to be reminded that, wow. that um you know we had that blessing yeah <laughs> I, 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 well, I, I totally agree with the sentiment that, that Richard uh, put across so uh, eloquently there. So, um, yeah, well answered. Um, but I, I honestly believe that your, your sound, especially during the 90s, was kind of the ultimate pop rock drum sound. And it was quite, it, you, had, you kind of had your own thumbprint going on. Do, would you agree with that, John? With the mix yeah, of the yeah. harmonics and, you know, everything else? Sure. Brilliant question. And... <clears throat> You know, um, it's sort of my, it's my Achilles heel, but it's also my, you know, superpower mm. was the way I hit and played um, was, I think if I just take it back, way back when I was younger, um, I, I did a lot of soft martial arts <clears throat> and through the power of breath and the control, uh, and, and it was because it was soft martial arts, it was slow. And it really just allowed me to just completely focus on, on all the movements and all the, and all the muscles in my body and, um, and be conscious and aware as I'm moving. 
and it kind of with Tai Chi slowed things down, but it, so it kind of made time. It, it's really hard to explain. It, it kind of suspends time, and he and he, 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 he turn into Morpheus from from um, Matrix or something. Like it, it gets <laughs> okay. quite. Tri trippy and that enabled me to develop some power strokes <clears throat> and um my, my basic uh sort of um addressing position on the throne you know was that through breath and um the way i kind of spoke through the drums i had a lot of power in in those strokes and as i said before it was a bit like an achilles heel as well as my superpower was that is that it, I tended to sort of because we're in uh, starting to get in, in arenas and playing big gigs, you know, I was hitting hard. You know, I, I was really almost choking the drums. Mm. Um, but I kind of got over that that choking part and found the nuances in the drum skins where I could find these little notes and these little kind of like with rim shots on the snare and stuff. Sure. A kind of a different sort of sound. So once I locked that that stroke in, yeah. it just became a signature for me. You know, it cool. was a really thin brass snare tuned really high, like really rat -a -ta -ta -ta, You know, but when I hit it a certain way and a certain velocity, it just had this this you know incredible sound to it. Um, and some other tricks like. Um, like a little disc, a little or a coin on the bass drum pedal. Okay. But using a wooden beater. Oh, so perfect. what yeah. that gave the engineer, yeah, what gave the engineer is a real, um, you know, peak of, of the high end yeah. on the kick drum. And it, and it just was one of those little things that instantly allowed the engineer to kind of to, to build the bottom end out of what, what we had in the shell. Mm -hmm. But that, that, that attack on that little um, disc, um, just and that was that was a comment that Niall, Niall Rogers made to me when he first saw us play live in, in Canada. He just went, "Whoa, that 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 kick drum was just." Um, and so, so we, really, when you break it down, you got a kick and a snare. I mean, that's two things yeah. um, which can make completely the difference between totally. a normal, you know, just sort of tap and the drum or whatever, but. So, so yeah, I, I did develop a very unique sound, and it was very loud sound. <laughs> um, and and I think you know, it was a, it was a it was a real amazing thing, but it can sometimes be not such a great thing for for because uh, it doesn't work for every song, you know. No. But but once you get you know those, those traditional um, I say traditional, but at the time um, the, the methods of recording, you know, in the eighties to the late eighties. And when even Phil Collins started to to use, you know, um, gates, gated reverb, oh. gated compressed uh, ambience, you know, uh, these square wave sort of opening and closing sounds, you know, and just having and and having that power in in the in the uh, snare stroke um, with. You know, really great room with some great mics and a great engineer. We, we were able to really just yeah you know, push that envelope, sure. really squeeze those com compressors into the op open uh, ambient mics and trigger them on and off with a kick and the snare. And, and that sort of, we I just took that that um, method and, and just kind of threw some steroids on it. I guess <laughs> big time. And but you know, ah! it all it all it. The energy um, that you created on your albums was matched live, wasn't it, with the same sounds, and they they, they went hand in hand with each other. I, as far as I'm concerned, anyway. Well, Maddie, that that's really wonderful to hear, and I think I've got to really uh, start by recognizing the producers of the albums of In Excess to to thank them for that because the first couple of albums we did were kids, you know. Were I mean, I was just I just turned sixteen and I was in In Excess, you know. Of course, yeah. Um, I mean, it took a while to, plus we had no money. It wasn't like we were just sort of around, you know, and in Australia um, in that position, um, you know, we just had to work that little bit harder to get equipment. We had to work that little bit harder to get, uh, you know, intel on, on how 
things work. And, and we weren't involved in that music scene in LA or New York or Chicago or London or wherever, um, where it's all happening. You know, mm. we, we really had to kind of build it um, uh, because it was just so far away f- for us because we were in Australia. Of course. Um, but, but, you know, um, but I have to thank the producers, uh, notably Mark Opitz, who was the first guy who really opened up our recordings to match what we did live, you know, because we, we got a name for ourselves as a live band, Maddie. We weren't, we weren't sort of, our records in the beginning weren't what got us known. It was our live reputation. Even before we had a record deal, we were packing houses, you know, 2,000 people a night. Wow, okay. Which is, which is extraordinary, you know, because yeah. it was word of mouth. So we were, we were just touring, like driving these shit bomb cars, you know, literally we'd leave on the side of the road when they ran out of Red Joe. We just started so crap. Um, and that's how we got around, you know, and, uh, and we just played and we played. But, but when we were recording, we'd go into the studio and it'd be like, now we're recording. And we didn't sort of match the live energy with our recording sure. until a couple of, about three albums in. Yeah. And Mark Opitz, Australian, awesome, you know, absolutely uh, just an awesome guy as well, a beautiful uh, producer. And then, of course, Chris Thomas, who'd done The Pretenders and worked on the White Album of the Beatles and, and, and you know, Paul McCartney, John, Elton John, um, the list goes on, yeah, Roxy Music. It was when... Chris Thomas saw us play for the first time. I think it was the Palladium in Hollywood. And then we met up in um, Dallas, Texas, uh, when we were on tour, believe it or not, with Adam Ant, Adam and the Ants. Okay. Um, he, came, he saw us and we were, we were opening for Adam and the Ants. Um, and, um, you know, our, our, our records were kind of charting at that point in America. Mm-hmm. And um, we were sort of kind of a burgeoning force. So when we came on as, as opening acts, it was always very intimidating for the um, headliner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay, we're finished, you know, all yours. You know? <laughs> um, Follow but, that. But, <laughs> yeah, you know, and that was just because we were young and, and, mm-hmm. and everyone was, that was what it was like. Um, but Chris Thomas said, I want to try to make you guys – uh, make your guys' albums reflect and represent what you do live. Mm. And, and that's really, it took us a few albums to get to the point where the album should sound like what we do live and what we do live should sound like the album. So it did take us a long time, Maddie. It wasn't, you know, you, you look at someone like Coldplay and, and like from, from the opening track on their first album, it's pretty consistent to the, to the last thing they recorded. I and mean, it's almost like, yeah, how did you do that? You know, um, where our our um, development and our learning and all that stuff was really in public. Everything we did was was in public and for, for the world to see. Um, yeah, I think um, my first introduction to In Excess was listening like thieves, I think. And um, w- w- had had electronics started coming in at that point because it was it's quite hard to it's quite, if it has it's discreetly done. Put it that way. Right, right, yeah, excellent. And another brilliant question. So I realized um, only later in my career that I was only maybe um, not much company um, to share the space of pioneering uh, machines with drumming. Mm. Um, it's a little cloudy, that that epoch, that period of time where we were coming out of the 70s, we were coming into sort of the early 80s. We had bands like The Cars, you know, we had some kind of LA sort of a little bit LA punk, but because, you know, punk was really, um, it started like, you know, Kings Road in, in London. We always thought that the Americans doing punk was like, you know, what do they know about punk? I mean, they're American. Like, these guys are, you know, the Eagles, and it's and it's and it's and it's and it's, you know, it's awesome soul music, and it's Motown, and and, and you know, America's got you know soft rock, and they've got some really awesome, you know, country rock, and they've got, but punk, nah, you know. But later on, obviously, everyone adopted their own little versions of punk, and, and what I'm getting to is, um, 
that basically uh, I, I, uh, I I think, sorry, can you just remind me, I've just had a mental blank then. What was the, where are we heading with this question again? Oh, what was well, the question? <laughs> well, I, I mentioned uh, that. The, oh, the, the, the machine, like, sorry. Yeah, the, yeah. 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 Yeah, the machines. So, so what I'm sort of getting at is just trying to paint a picture of that period around about the early '80s, okay, um, where we were all still all players. You know, we're playing, okay. The thought of a rhythm box was was kind of like a novel, and and it still is to me. You know, um, but there was a, either a little Korg. Uh, rhythm box where you press, you had samba or you had, you know, bossa nova or you had, you know, like, you know, uh, foxtrot or you had whatever it was. And that was like, you know, kind of funny, you know, like you press it, you know, it was like, fuck yeah. this, you know, it, it's wacky, it's nutty, you know, you know, it's not, it's not replacing the, the full ensemble of percussive orchestration, you know, I mean, it's, th- th- there are, there are little chips, there are little, little tiny, voice oscillators that were being triggered. Um, there's all sorts of wacky little things they did in those machines to make them try to replicate and, and uh, facsimile yeah. a real sound. And to me, I thought it was kind of folly. I thought it was funny. I thought it was cool. So, yes, to answer your question, I, I was using machines, and so was my brother Andrew because he was um, – Principally writing the song, so he'd use a little drum machine sure. to 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 play his chord progressions over. And when he delivered, uh, come let's listen to what everyone's done time uh, before we record an album. There'd always be these little rhythm boxes mm-hmm. in 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 the in the demos. Yeah, sure. I like those things. Uh, you know, and, and and a great example of how that that was inspiring me was Chris Thomas again. Uh, with Roxy Music, when you hear um, like uh, you know Avalon or, or or some of those albums like um, Manifesto, mm-hmm. um, where there is these you know um, I don't know if you know a song called Dance Away. Yes, I do. Yeah, and there's is that is that really cool little rhythm box in there, yeah. and um, um, you know. And the way Chris and the drummer worked with that machine, uh, that I love that. That that was what got me in, into the machines. And of course, I started pioneering beyond that. Um, so I started to bring uh, machines next to me. So I'd have, have a machine next to me, and I'd either even if it was just a hat pattern, like a sixteenth pattern, like a or something, you know, yeah. then I could just play against that. And because it was clocked and locked um, in its own, um, you know, metronome way, it enabled me to be able to come in and around the, the tempo. I can either push it or I can lay back on it. And, that, and it created this tension, this kind of, and because Andrew is such a great funky guitar rhythm player and being, you know, blood brothers, uh, as my, uh, my other brother, Tim, and NXS as well. Sure. You know, it's it just the combination of, of, of me, my brother playing a funky guitar and me kind of pulling or pushing against that uh, that rhythm box. I, I just loved it. So I used it all the time. Yeah. And it was and it was uh, controversial. There were, there were some guys in the band that didn't like it, you know. Um, there were some people, in, in notably journalists, were funny about it. Um, but I integrated it. I kept, I kept, you know, I, I, I had a linen drum mm. by my side on, on stage. So I had to dial in the tempo, you know, yeah. I had to, you know, it was a, it was a, a rotary dial and it was an, uh, it wasn't, it was like a, a different type of display on the tempo. So it'd be very easy to miss it. So if I wanted to start a song at 110 beats per minute, you know, it was really hard to find 110. I'd have to dial and go, you know, 108, you know, 111, you know, 109, you know, come on, you know, 110. Okay, that's how long it would take. Sure. Between a song that I'm trying to futz with between a song or something, well, then I was like, come on, Johnny. And I'm like, hang on, you know. <laughs> but but it became this this part of my, the way I work. And, of yeah. course, as the electronics developed and as more people were getting smarter and their integration with circuitry and, 
and some sophisticated um, circuitry boards. And then the sound sampling became better and suddenly we had clocking and yeah. we were able to, you know, we were able to go in sync and suddenly, you know, using a SMPTE off a, um, off off the uh, the code the coding that we would strike on a twenty foot um, track two inch master tape. One of those channels was dedicated to a SMPTE code. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I could clock machines off it, and then I was able to write patterns that were integrated in between what I'm doing. So there's offsetting and then doubling up or whatever it was. So I'm weaving through the the uh, the, the clock source and and, and the uh, syncopation of wh whatever I programmed on, on these um, machines. And of course, then as the um, the the sampling world started to develop, then I was then I was really exploring you know Akai samplers, getting into S S uh, 900s and S 950s and S 1000s and so on, S 3200s, and I and I was developing my own sounds, I was sampling from the studio, we'd get a drum sound and I'd actually sample that, and import it yeah. into the sampler, into the sampler and then I would um, edit the waveform and then I would I'd, I'd key it off, whatever I was playing, and it would be coming out. So we'd integrate that into the recording as well. So so what what was happening was, as, as you said, it was kind of meshed together. Mm. And so sometimes you go, oh, I think I can hear that. But was it? Well, wasn't it? You know, was was yeah. that a electronic thing or was that? That's me. And that's I'm where really where I had fun. With it. Yeah. So so sometimes it was overtly um, in your face machine. Another yeah. time it was kind of hard to tell. Yeah. And I still get compliments on, on um, certain drum takes um, that weren't mine. You know, there were a sample. You know, and so I still have to sort of say thank you very much, but that wasn't me. It was actually a sample. I don't even know who it was. You know, uh, so but it's a really interesting uh, conversation, this Maddie, because I find that if I can um, uh, be so bold as to to say that I'm not sure how I feel about that, that these days. You know, um, because machines have now become such a an acceptable part of our life to the point where we now have devices, you know, strapped to our heads. We've got this thing like next to our head all day long, you know. Sure, sure. Um, I don't really like that bit. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of going, okay, okay. I, I, what a, I feel like Mickey Mouse, you know, and Fantasia and, and okay. stirring up the hornet's nest and, and suddenly AI is like everywhere and I can't escape it. Um, I've actually even started to call uh, where music is heading transmusicism because it's, gone so far from the analog um, natural living player into yeah. just a series of, of inserted uh, mechanical sounds that are being robotized and, and just, and, and, to, and, and in the entire unit, what's called a song now, uh, can be, to me, just sounds like industrial noise, yeah. you know. So, so it has gone too far in yeah. my view, but, but, uh, I have to um, take, take you know, honestly, uh, the view that I was while I was pioneering that. I never realised it was going to end up being so prevalent as it is now. No, I to I totally agree with you. But but what you <laughs> had was pretty unique at the time, wasn't it? And and as I say, instantly identifiable. If you take if you take everything out apart from the drums, you'd still know. That's John Farris. You just you just you, yeah. you just, it was, and it was for quite a number of years. I mean, this leads nicely on to my next um point question if you like and and that uh, that was the infamous uh Wembley gig in 91 uh which you know so many people still rave about to this day i mean that, yeah. obviously that must have been the, uh, an incredible uh day for you anyway and i'm guessing that was the real high point of your um uh careers in the uk i guess or you know is it a day you remember fondly yeah, it is, Maddie, and and um, you know, as as in life, um, everybody would know what I mean. You know, you, there are things that stick out in your life um, and moments. Luckily for us, um, we filmed and recorded that that gig, mm. which has helped it sort of become. Um, a lot more enigmatic sure. than just another gig because it has been 
sealed and and, and uh, presented um, for safekeeping for for time, you know, um, and and uh, that day w- was. What's really important to just mention is, you know, obviously it was a, a huge day. But what was really clever about Chris Murphy, our manager at the time, and the agents we had, uh, were recognizing that in excesses, you know, best moments are when we're kind of in that that um, that that sweet spot that meditative sweet spot where we've been on tour for a while, all the all the um, machinations are really nicely oiled. It, 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 it's a beautiful working machine. You know, we've got everything sorted out. The crew's all good. You know, uh, w- there might be some issues in the background of in private lives and that's always the case, but but just speaking on and to the touring part and, and the the quiver, you know, the repertoire we had in our quiver, you know, at that point, you know, we had a lot of material at that stage, you know. Yeah. Um, but what I'm saying is that we'd already played six Wembley, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was six Wembley arenas before we did the stadium. Sure. sure. So we were already we we're already just doing like, you know, it wasn't just um poked out of the middle on its own. It was, you know, Wembley Stadium was just another kick, you know. Um, but that was why I was saying it was clever is because that we made sure that, you know, we, it, it, it wasn't, we weren't, we're just coming cold onto the stage in Wembley and, and go, you know, winging a prayer. Like we were, we were match fit at that point, you know, uh, and, um, and the more of he's just another day that we could fit into that that moment, the more comfortable and relaxed and better it was going to be. And that's exactly what I think the outcome was. It was just another gig, you know. Yeah. And but it was, but it was the the culmination of all that work mm. uh, and all that that um, focus and all that dedication and that kind of projection of of what. We want to deliver to the audience was already yeah, well, well and truly underway, and so it just happened to be that as we passed through, you know, that gig, it captured a perfect, uh, a sort of a perfect moment of what it would have been like at every other gig on that tour. Yeah, yeah. it's there forevermore, which is just amazing. Yeah. I read it. I, I was watching it a few days back, and um, I, I was reading some of the comments, which I always some of them fascinate me. Some of them are ridiculous, as you know. But there was one comment, and I thought this is really true. And um, I think the comment went something like, "The only thing that dates this is the fact that there's nobody with camera phones in the audience. Otherwise, it could have been yesterday. It's that it sounds that current, you know, and the stage show was." Wow. Which I thought was a great, wow. great comment to make from I don't know who it was, but I just thought Well, and it is a great comment to make. I have to say it's probably someone who's a little older. Um because yeah. because when I when I do look back at it, because it because it shows up all the time. Um and I look at it and I go, Oh god, you know, gee, it, it, you know, compared to today where if you don't have you know, a 10 meter by 40 meter LED screen uh, behind you and, and you know, half a million dollars of content, you know, whizzing around and, and all that stuff. And with another, you know, five cameras in the audience uh, capturing and then projecting on the wide screens on each side of the PA and all this sort of stuff that everyone's used to. Sure. Um, I mean, that, that was science fiction, you know, back in 1991. I mean... It was like if you can't walk on stage with a, with a good lighting director and and uh, maybe a, a decent set and uh, a, a good crew and you can't put a good show together, then, then what are you? You know. Um, but but these days it's it, it well I think these days it would be great for someone in our antiquity to walk on stage if we had all this content mm-hmm. and all this beautiful sexy you know LED screen to make up for the fact we can't run around like morons and jump off PA systems <laughs> <stuff> anymore. Um, <laughs> 
we'd probably be showing images of us running around jumping off PA while we're standing there, um, <laughs> trying not to fall over. Um, but but look, I mean, you know, it is great to know that uh, once upon a time that uh, a an iPhone wasn't in someone's pocket distracting them from the opportunity to enjoy a concert. I mean, how many people these days are, are fucking around or fumbling around with a phone yeah. while with someone performing, trying to capture it or whatever they're doing? And and there's there's this kind of it's like an agent, you know. Yeah. This has become the agent, yeah. Um, where you've got to you know sort of use it to uh, to interface with your with your life. That's why I was saying I feel a little bit. Um, now I look back at all that, that that pioneering I was doing with technology and trying to get it involved in music and, you know, to the point where I, I succeeded so well that now I'm like, okay, stop, stop, you know, slow down. Um, so, now, now we won't, we won't but, but I'll tell you, you something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, of course. Um, but what what is um, ironic and funny uh, is, and I was saying this to my kids the other day, um, is that, you know, if there was someone in the audience who had a camera, uh, especially an SLR with a big lens or something, you know, there'd be security running around course, and everyone, true. like, kids don't understand this. If you had a camera in the audience and you were seen using that camera, a big bouncer would run on over to you, grab the camera, open up the back, pull the film out, and then hand it back to the person. Yeah. And it was like, no, 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 no. You can't take photographs because you know it's all it's all sewn up and, it, and it's got to be it's got to be um, all, all you know uh, brought through and funneled in into one portal um, so that there was control over who had the photos and what they were and all this stuff. And now I think, dang, wouldn't it have been great if everyone had iPhones back in those days? Because there would have been so much more caption. Of course, of course. there would have been thousands of different points of view from every concert and every one we did, yeah. there would have been all sorts of amazing antics that happened which were lost, <laughs> uh, except for those memories that, that are still, you know, holding on to those participants in the audience that were witnessing stuff yeah. that were happening on stage that were just amazing, like, or, you know, got people from the audience running on and, and there's all this funny stuff we used to do and, and all that stuff's gone, like it's lost. It wasn't captured, you know. There isn't any record of it. Yeah, we, we, we find it really hard to, to scrape up photographs yeah. that everyone hasn't seen before. You know, um, I get that. I but, get but that. Yeah, but but that's you know, what, just, on, on the other hand, though, there was kind of an air of mystery. If you didn't have a ticket, you would you were always in the back of your mind. You were like, oh, what? I wonder what the gig was like. How? Or you'd wait right. for a magazine to come out and see the pictures. You know, now you know. You, anybody can go to a gig and you can just go on Facebook and go, oh, there it is. There's 10 songs from the gig. I don't, you know, but that air of mystery has gone now. But I, I totally get that, you know, what you're saying. Yeah. And and and, and you're saying exactly what I'm saying. And, and thank you. Um, you know, for those who know exactly what you and I are talking about, you know, it might be, yeah, yeah, you know, we already know this, but there's a lot of, you know, people who weren't alive at that at that time who don't really quite know what we're saying. You know, it, it, and and what what we're saying is that the the focus from the audience made the gig. Mm. The, the 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 you know cooperation and 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 the the um. The reality that was co-created by the audience participants uh, being focused on the stage, and that was all that was on their minds, you know, was incredibly powerful. I mean, that's like a fellowship, you know, that, that, is, a, that is a meditation of whether it's 200, 2,000, 20,000 or 100,000 people. Um, that's what they were. They were like a, a concentrated, focused um human experience mm. of joy and fellowship and everyone unifying, you know, and, and without phones or without any distraction. And, and that, I think we're all blessed to experience that. Yeah. Uh, I, I know I certainly am. And that's what lingers 
uh, for me. That, that, cool. that, that's, it's the analog stuff that lingers for me. Yeah. yeah. Cause I, 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 and genuinely, I used to, uh, I used to wait for magazines to come out and I would pour over pictures for weeks, just picking things out. And, and it, I'd be genuinely excited, you know, but yeah. now it's, it's yeah. oh, there's, you know, but hey, maybe I'm just old. I don't know. No, no, no. It's, I mean, look, I mean, of course, you know, um, you know, the mind goes straight to, you know, as a ma male, you know, we, we, all, we all, you know, have a one track mind, but it's similar if I use metaphors, you know, like, the foreplay's gone, you know, the it's it's everything's instant when I want it now. And so that 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 foreplay, that 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 anticipation, you know, that mystery the mystery is what you're talking about, you know, knowing that there's a gig coming up or it's weeks away and 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 or months away or whatever, and, and you're you you know, that all that culminates into this amazing mm. sort of um yeah, one wonderful explosion of of of, of uh, experience, uh, which I, I definitely think that's lost now. Yeah. We don't have that anymore. Yeah. Um, and 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 uh, I just want to tilt my hat to, to those days because I think they're absolutely that that's what uh, you know made me so inspired and, and uh, enjoyed touring. That's why I, I loved it. Totally, totally get that. Now, there's one thing which I have to mention because. I, I, every time I hear this song, I wait for this patiently. And that is in Need You Tonight, the China symbol. The <laughs> that is one of my favorite. And do you know what? Such a simple thing. But every time I hear it, I'm like, that's just, that's just perfection. You don't often hear it with a bass drum for a start. It's usually with a snare drum. So I don't know if it, right. it sounded like it was with a bass drum. I don't know. But uh, you played it. So. <laughs> You'll know. Well, okay. All right. And this is a really great, as a really interesting, man, I would not have in a million years, if I had to bet that that's what you would have plucked out of that. But I'm really glad you did. <laughs> it's, it's a brilliant uh, example of what I was saying about the marriage of machines and, and the real playing mm. was because Andrew wrote, wrote that song to this kind of groove that was a a, a, a drum machine. Yeah. Mm. So the, the dang, 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 ding, 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 right? Well, Chris Thomas and I worked uh, really closely with the drums on that because that was that was triggered. Um the the beat, the basic beat. So that the the, um, the part that goes Mm -hmm. The side set, right? That that was that was a machine. Okay. And then the bass drum and the snare were a machine. Um, and then we 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 sampled the snares and we did all these different things. We had a hand clap and a couple of all other things and, and we matched them together and we and we, we built our own kick samples and we and then we triggered the kick, we triggered the snare, and we had the uh the, the side stick doing this kind of counter rhythm thing, and it was just this. You know, it was just this machine that was just stomping along, and, and you know when you, because they were back in the days in the studio when we had big fuck off monitors, like yeah, yeah, they were big, they were loud. The whole room was immersive, you know, you know, and in it was inside the speaker box, you know. Um, and what I did was I, I, I just crafted all this little toppy, you know, little cowbell mm. stuff and little bongo thing. And so all oh, that's overdubs. Cool. So the China, which is a, that bit, um, was just me just farting around, you know, in a in a in a in a room with a bunch of different sounds, you know. And then Chris would have Chris Thomas would have just gone, you know, and and kind of featured that. Um, but you know, I, I don't even know if I can take uh, credit for it other than I played it. But I mean. A uh, Chris balanced that <laughs> in a way, and, and and married up that that hybrid thing I'm talking about, and that's uh, so interesting. That's really interesting. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Sure. So when when you hear that song again, you will hear there's lots of fiddly stuff on the top end. Yeah. There's all this little just just lots of little things, and then little bongo stuff. So that's um, all live. That's all you. Yeah, but yeah. there might be a four bar or an eight bar loop. 
but the symbol was just was just me. That's a take. That's just me sitting yeah. there going, you know, when, when the time comes, it, da, 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 you know. And then um, there was some other little. Uh, there was a couple of little splashes in there, I think, as well. Mm. Uh, I think even before I'm lonely, before that bit, there was a couple of little offbeat splashes. And when you were saying that, I did I have the kick at the same time as the um, mm. as, as as the China symbol? Is it? That's why it probably sounds interesting because I wasn't playing kick when I was hitting the symbol. Makes sense. Yeah. And you picked it because it doesn't sound like it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because if the kick was in the same room as the symbol, it would have affected the symbol sound. Yeah. Right, and so that impact of the kick with this, with with the with that um, China, it would have changed the sound of the China. Yeah, it's it's, um, a, it's one of those. Set, it's just I wait for it patiently because I just think it's genius. I really do. <laughs> I love it. And it's such a well, simple. Isn't that amazing? How huh? you know you've interviewed Steve Gadd. And, and here we are talking about, you know, the most simple overdub that I mean, anyone could do. Um, and by the way, I listen to I more and more. I listen to more of the stuff I grew up listening to. I listen to it more and more now. Um, and, I'm, and I'm just swimming in these drummers that are so fucking good, you know, that just blow my mind. Sure. Like Jeff Beccaro, like Jeff, you know, like, like Steve Gadd, you know, like oh, just so many, you know. Brilliant, disciplined, um, tasteful, uh, you know, doing remarkably tasteful yet, co you know, complex things, but still had room. Yeah, that's the thing. They, they were still pulling back, right? Yeah. You know, totally, totally with you. Like, wow. You know, like, and my go to with that stuff is usually Steely Dan. Or you know those guys, you know. Mm. Um, um, but but again, my buddy like Steve Lukather and, and uh, the Toto guys, you know. I mean, you know that 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 group of musicians, that whole that whole you know incredible craftsman that we, you know, I wished I I was in that 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 you know group of people at that time but we were so isolated in australia we, that we didn't know anything like that yeah yeah to, just to be to be rubbing shoulders and that sort of stuff but 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 that's what inspired me if i just uh if there is a question on your list somewhere about what inspired me it would be it would be all that it would be those guys it would be um you know a weather report you know um uh steely dan uh motown huge mm. for me yeah Massive, and I still listen to it twice a week, religiously, to all the Marvin Gaye stuff. Mm. Um, and I'm still finding stuff that I hadn't heard before. Really? Yeah, isn't just, that great? <laughs> it's just awesome, and, and 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 that's to me that art, the recording, the the, the playing, and, and you know, it's it's not the same anymore. No. Would you agree with that? I, to I totally agree. Yeah, <laughs> you don't, you, it's no. these days. It's hard to know. Um, you know, anybody can go and put down a track. Uh, you know, we, ev everything can be fixed these days, can't it? You know, I don't think you need the same amount of talent anymore, do you? You know, I, I know we've talked about uh, obviously using machines and things, but you've always replicated it live. So there's, you know, there's never any question there. So um right and that's true. Yeah and and sometimes well and <clears throat> excuse me. I'll just tell you a funny little little story um and then because I want to get back to what you just said about you know live and the machines. But but talking about live and machines is it back in the mid 80s. Um you know there was journalists coming to gigs in excess gigs and going oh it sounds like you know they've got they've got some um tapes playing Tapes <laughs> and, and, and and like like there's some guy you know, with headphones at the back pressing play with a big <laughs> tape machine going like you're good to go guys you can play now the, the tapes rolling you know um like I don't know what these journalists fantasized in their head but but one gig which which um stood out to me which was kind of I look back only by accident uh, which was recently 
was Radio um, City Music Hall, you know, a very prestigious theater in New York, you know, on, on Broadway there. Um, amazing theatre with just, you know, uh, all these beautiful um, opera boxes up in, in, in the, in the you know, it was three, three stories and it's like, wow, amazing, you know. Sure. And there we were, this prestigious, you know, Radio City Music Hall uh, in excess play, this Australian rock band play. And um, the journalist who, who did a, uh, a review of the concert just saying, yeah, it sounds like, you know, there was like a, um, a pre-recorded kick drum and some some other stuff. I mean, why can't these people just play live? And you know, what what's the you know? And I'm just thinking, like, w- did you have a good time? Did you did you boogie? Did you have fun? Like, w- were you were you like, did you notice that there was a, a, a jam packed house of people just going up there fucking nuts? You know, like, and and, we, and this guy tried to pick apart you know this 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 stuff. And so I'm just I'm, what I'm really trying to illustrate is how the focus of certain things can shift over time and that critics, you know, critiques. I mean, it's just a joke uh, because now uh, what blows my mind um, is how unmind-blowing it is to go to a DJ concert, you know, that is just the most unmind-blowing thing. It's just standing there going, well, I don't get it. What's the, yeah. all these lights whizzing around. There's a guy that presses play, yeah. just like we were told or, or accused of doing. Yeah. And Standing no, there going like this. There's some pre-recorded music with no one anywhere, any anywhere to be seen. It's it's just bizarre, you know. But but that's been normalized because it's it, it's a, it's a cultural thing that's been normalized. But I just wanted to mention that funny little uh, that, that that I just remember reading that recently, going, wow, you know, I was being hammered and bashed around by having a couple of augmentations on stage. But but then later on, you know, towards the um, I always had augmentation on stage because uh, I felt it was kind of part of the the sound. You know, some yeah. things I just le- left it up to if I can't reproduce it on stage. Um, there's there's six people on stage, all very busy. You know, if there's a couple of or or whatever happening coming out of a machine, like who cares? You know, I don't know. It, it didn't really bother me, but but I was also using at the time. Um, uh, Simmons pads. Yes. Uh, back in those days, and because I broke them physically, just they simply couldn't uh, sustain being bashed by big huge sticks, which is totally acceptable. Um, I had to try different pads to trigger things. Sure. Um, so the trigger pad itself had all sorts of iterations, and uh, I saw everything from D drum to Pearl to you know, custom stuff I had built uh, and Simmons, etc. But what was happening was is that those pads were plugged into an interface which was then plugged into a sampler unit. Yeah. So I was triggering uh, certain um, brass licks or uh, a, a, a vocal... Uh, harmony or something kind of really random and out there, but no one would realize that I'm the one who was playing it. Yeah. So, like, you know, you know, what I mean, like just hitting, just striking something once, and it would just have this thing, and and so I got really used to having that as part of my ensemble as well, which was really great. So some songs where I, I didn't want to click track all the way through mm-hmm. on stage. Having to having to listen to uh, you know a metronome, sure. um, I was able to just play it off the pad, and and that's the sort of stuff I was pioneering. But now it's like everyone does it. Everyone, DJs have it with their little finger, like have a coffee and just press the little thing, you know. But I mean, we we were trying to find all these different ways of of, of bringing these sounds, these 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 um, recognizable uh, little pop packets of. of in excess productions that were just, I was able to just fire them off depending on the song, and, which and is just, I, I didn't know if anyone knew that. I just thought. Well, do you know, really fascinating. And of course it made your, your drum kit look pretty unique at that time as well. Cause you have the symbols up <laughs> high and you had the rotor toms right. on the Simmons and, and it looked again, yeah. along, along with the sound of it, you knew it was your kit apart from it said in excess on the bass drum head, but yeah, <laughs> even if it didn't yeah. you'd go, 
I know whose that is. You yeah. know, because it was so yeah. good looking, wasn't it? Yes, it was. And I used to really love it because the Roto Toms were, were really my main go to um, Tom. And, and again, in the beginning of the interview, I was explaining how I sort of developed this power stroke. Mm. And I kind of used the Roto Toms in the same way. So I, 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 I hit, um, uh, you know, a rim shot. And, and because that skin is like a, on a rototom is like a suspended skin. There's no, there's no shell. Mm. So it's just a suspended, uh, uh, you know, tightened skin in midair. Yeah. Uh, it had some really interesting um, acoustic artifacts that were different from a shell, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, it was a lot more uh, percussive in the sense that it was, it was more uh, transient. It wasn't like a doo. Or a boo. You know, it was like a bang and a bonk. You know, all these weird sort of sounds that I was able to kind of get by whipping them a certain way, you know. And, and I loved all that. And because I was slimline, then I could I could get a rototom and I get a Simmons pad kind of in over here oh. and I get something else over here. So it was just a question of pulling up, you know, depending on how far my reach was that hit that particular um thing to be hot hit and and so what we what we did was we ended up calling it the mothership because it just looked like some weird <laughs> some weird uh post-apocalyptic uh, agricultural you know sort of equipment or something <laughs> thrown together with, with, with tables coming out of it and everything so um i i have fond memories of that i loved i love those days you know i love those days when we we're still Still a little bit analog, but the digital thing was just enough to to, to make it all work. Um, and uh, yeah, so it, it's it's really nice to reflect on those on those oh, times. I, I remember looking at that the, the pictures of it as a kid, and and I vaguely I I, I I I think I've got this right. Did you have a feature in Rhythm Magazine at that time back in the early nineties? I seem to remember pictures of it in the UK drum magazine. And I remember okay, yeah. just looking at it going, wow, it was like something, <laughs> something space age almost, you know? Yeah, well, it is. And I wish I had one ready. I know I've got it somewhere. I don't want to be scrounging around, wasting your time while I try to find it. I don't know. I've got it at hand somewhere. Um, I'll see if I can find it. But, but um, yeah, you know, and, and look, um, so really – what what I really um, love to use um, in terms of traditional shells was was just the kick drum mm-hmm. and then a floor tom mm-hmm. and it was really the floor tom where I was able to get my nice you know um, traditional tom sound yeah um, and uh, but then the roto toms and everything else was were, were just sort of uh, um, a, a, a more you know they, they were just icing on the cake that there were some little uh interesting um sound sound pockets to throw in amongst because you gotta understand that in excess like we were loud you know we had three guitars when there was only a few like there was three guitar players like uh you know even with michael without an instrument you know there was a lot of noise generated off that stage and everyone was starting to get into their own thing. There was delays, there was echoes, there was repeats, there was, you know, um, long sustaining guitars, there were power chords, there's all this stuff. I mean, where the fuck do you find room for a nice good old fashioned Tom sound? I mean, it would have got lost in there, you know, and that's why I went for short, sharp, sort of pokey kind of percussive sounds. Oh, so you had to fight your way through, basically. <laughs> However, it happened. I love it. Just I mean, it's, it, it, I've always, I've always said that you know, I, I'm there to, to, my job was to, to underpin what's best for the song. Mm. You know, I mean, of course, with all that, you know, chest beating. You know, there were moments of absolutely ridiculous indulgence that were un- unnecessary, and I wasn't, you know probably even licensed to be able to be doing stuff like that. But putting the, the um, you know, self-acknowledged, uh, you know, 
self-indulgence aside, um, for the most part, yeah, I, I did have to um, try and find sounds to compete with everything else yeah. that worked, that suited the song. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, I'm just trying to demonstrate how things develop, you know. That's why those sharp, short sounds that I created were there is because we had these big, thick walls of, of, of guitar sounds and all this other big you know, keyboard washes and, and huge, you know, big sounds that swallowed up the entire, you know, frequency spectrum. Well, <laughs> you know what? It worked, and, and that was a huge part of the NXS sound, which, uh, you know, we're all so grateful that we've got that incredible back catalog. So, so thank you, John. That's all I can say. And, oh, and thanks, thank you for, uh, for being such an amazing guest and giving up your time so generously. I really appreciate it. So, um, oh, it's been a pleasure. pleasure. Uh, Maddie, it's really, really kind of you, um, to, to have the thought and the consideration to, um, and, uh, put so many great questions. And, um, and I apologize for my rambling, uh, I guess, <laughs> You know, I, I it, it it helps me too to to walk some of those memories, um, and uh, for your indulgence, so I'm I'm very grateful. Well, and uh, it's really nice to meet you. You too, you too. Uh, honestly, John, total pleasure. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And, Thank you. Uh, I'm going to bed. And enjoy the rest of your, your morning. Ten past two in the morning. So, um, but you know what? It it feels like half ten in the morning. So we're all good. <laughs> Thank you, John. Great, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, Manny. God bless you, buddy. Thank you. Reach out anytime you want. Yeah.